Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's time once again for our sacred marriage segment, which is something we're used to doing. We're glad to be doing. We do regularly, but we do have a little bit of a change here. First of all, welcome, dear. Glad you're here. Glad to be here. Uh, For today's sacred marriage uh, segment, we're on the road. Uh, We have left uh, my home studio, which is inside my office, which is downstairs in the basement, and we've moved all the way up to the kitchen. (laughs) So we are cooking in the kitchen, and one of the reasons why we're up here, among others, is uh, from our kitchen, as we look out of the uh, breakfast nook into the backyard, we're able to look at something beautiful, Mm. something that uh, fills us with joy, with pride, and also fills our bellies, and that is because of the diligent hard work of my precious wife. Mm. Uh, Those of you who uh, follow us on Facebook at uh, uh, rc-lisa Sproul or uh, other pl- or Instagram or any of those places uh, may have seen some of my wife's uh, videos of uh, the way God has blessed our garden, but I thought it would be a great thing to spend some time uh, talking with her about uh, why she does it, how she does it, uh, and how she feels uh, about it. So, sweetheart, we're going to talk about you and your victories uh, in the garden. Before we do that, one more thing I want to mention is how I've been blessed by it. Uh, I not only get to look at the beautiful garden, and this is just the small home one, and we'll get to that, uh, but I get to eat the food from it uh, that you've prepared, and I'm grateful for that. So mm-hmm. let's talk to the master gardener. <laughs> Maybe a good place to start here is I know, uh, being your husband, I've heard you talk about your upbringing and many of the uh, skills that you learned uh, at your mother's feet. Talk to me a little bit about uh, what you remember growing up uh, as, as gardening was a part of your family. So growing up in the 70s, um, probably like many families that grew up with gardens or they had parents that grew up in the Depression era, so they learned to preserve their food. And my mom was a master at that. She canned, she froze, she made freezer jam, she kept our family going on food that was in the garden. And my brother and I would each have a row. Okay. And um, I can't really tell you what was in that row. You know, I just know that we would have the responsibility of weeding the row. I, <clears throat> but that was a big deal. It, but it was natural it and was normal. It was natural. It was normal. It was... Um, go ahead. What were you well, doing? I was just going to say, when you talk about you having your own row and you don't remember what you planted, um, my experience was much, much more limited than yours. But I did have some experience when I was growing okay. up. Okay. Uh, Growing up on the old Laguna Valley Study Center, there were multiple uh, families living on this 50-acre plot. Mm -hmm. And one summer when I was very young, uh, Mr. Thompson, the Thompsons were the first family that went with us when we started the Mm -hmm. study center. Mr. Thompson plowed up uh, some space and all the kids got to have their own space and I had my space. And I remember going through the choosing of what to plant. And I, it just, yeah, as an adult, I look back on it and I think... Why did I choose that? No, I know exactly why I chose <laughs> okay, it. Choose? I chose peanuts and watermelon because those were oh, the only yeah. things I wanted to eat that, is so that you could plant. I didn't think about what's going to succeed. Mm-hmm. I didn't think about... Uh, you know, how even I don't like to eat zucchini, it would be great to have the great big ones because it's hard to not grow zucchini. Uh, but yeah, I picked peanuts and watermelons and pulled the peanuts way too early, and oh, uh, watermelon never got anywhere. So, uh, now, and that was one year, and that was it. I do remember also, I will say this again the difference between your mom and my mom. What, that same summer, one time Mr. Thompson was out there working in the garden. And uh, my mom said, hey, go outside and ask Mr. Thompson for a head of lettuce. And I went out, not knowing any better, said, Mr. Thompson, my mom would like a head of lettuce. And he looks down, and there's red lettuce, and there's green lettuce. Like what kind of lettuce? Yeah, there's not, but there's not a... Iceberg? Yeah, there's not a ball of iceberg like you get at the grocery store. And so 
And that's the kind of stuff we ate. No, she didn't know. Okay. Well, if it makes you happy, that's the kind of stuff we ate. I grew up on iceberg. Okay. I grew up on white bread. Uh Um, You know, my girlfriend across the way, her family had the home pride whole wheat bread, and I just thought that was marvelous. My Uh mom didn't want anything to do with it, so um, kind of skipped a generation because my other kids wanted all of that, too. But but it was a great little heritage. I mean, she she shared a lot of the responsibility, and kids pulled their weight a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. So that's kind of where a lot of my homemaking skills came from. I mean, she was a master of the garden and a master cook, and she formulated all of her own recipes, and she won uh, way back in the day when they would, you know, have pies or different things at the fair. Really? Not, not 4-H, but uh-huh. actual contests. She she had always done very well with that. So, um, and I always love that about her. So. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. now let's fast forward a little yeah. bit, and uh, you were now an adult you now have your own home what what made you think to start again to, mm. to, to you know when well, you don't have your mother telling you to do it right so I was probably like one of those odd 20 something I had a lot of really incredible women that impacted my life at the church and most uh-huh. of them were homeschooling women a lot of them had gardens and uh, there was just that I don't know that that whole homey feel of that a woman who looks well to the ways of her home isn't microwaving all her food. She's right. making it from scratch. She's, you know, raising it in the garden and she's working hard. And um, and I really didn't do that when I was a single mom. Okay. I did cook and balk when I was a single mom. Uh-huh. And but it wasn't until I had moved into the Van Wert, Ohio community away from home that I probably had my first box gardens. Okay. And um, those did wonderful. And I had dear friends. Yes, yeah, so let's hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> that were farmers. Um, you Kim, still have those dear Kim friends, Grubaugh, by the way. Uh, she was the matron, ma- my maid of honor, my mm-hmm. matron of honor, um, in our wedding. Uh-huh. And her husband is a farmer. Yeah. Um, Honest to goodness, professional acres. farmer, And yes. so I was so tickled that we literally had six stalks of corn and not one of them produce ears except for one that was pollinated the corner of my house and they Uh came over and I'm so proud of it they're just giggling and giggling she's like you're just such a city girl and um, she recently came out to the homestead garden and she's like oh my goodness yeah we're going to cover that that Mm -hmm. distance that gap there but uh, when you first started in Van Wert and had those six rows uh, did you find it rewarding did you have any frustrations Um, you know, it's been so long ago, honey. I don't know that I, I'm sure there were frustrations. I think trying to get the soil right has Uh always been a problem until this year. And I think we kind of resolved a lot of that. Now we'll know kind of more next year because we'll probably put a a top dose of that compost on there. But, um, but everything grew really well. Okay. And I think we only had maybe two or three garden boxes. Okay. And these are four by four boxes or four by eight? Maybe as long as what we have out there, um, now. Um, but you know, it was just growing tomatoes, peppers, things that we like to eat. Okay. It wasn't, um, a variety. Uh-huh. I probably, I might've had squash out there. I think I did because I think that's when I started making zucchini bread, but, um, <clears throat> but it wasn't, it wasn't glorious and I was only there for three years, but it did feel very fulfilling and it, it was kind of fun. And the kids all went out there and they managed the garden. Every one of my daughters and when Aaron was little and he'd come mm-hmm. up and he'd go out there to the garden and they'd go pick the things for supper and that's kind of a neat thing. You send your kids out and say, go pick me some carrots or go pick me yeah. tomatoes or, or Go peppers. ask Mr. Thompson for a head up. <laughs> yeah, our neighbors did not have a garden so there was no go ask anybody but um, but it was very fun and rewarding. Well, good. And I, I, I think when I asked about the frustrations, I think one of the blessings, and you mentioned you know not just cooking our meals in a microwave, one of the blessings of doing this uh, is it does get you back in touch with God's sort of natural processes by which food comes to us. Mm-hmm. You know, the the apart from this, our propensity is, or, or many people's propensity is, you know, you go to the store, you buy pre-processed packaged food, you take it home, you heat it up, you might get some vegetables, but the vegetables have been shipped from chili right uh, you There's know no con- nu- nutrient content yeah and you and, and if it doesn't work out for chili then somewhere else they'll the store will find it and bring it to you and mm-hmm. but there's this uh you know we're having to worry is it going to rain uh, a couple times this summer we had to worry about hail is, is the hail going to be 
too, so big that it's going to damage the cross. We did have a little bit, but it didn't hurt anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is that sense of dependence that, that is yeah. really uh, not just a scary thing while you're waiting, but it is very rewarding when you're done. And, and I should say, uh, you know, by God's grace, we've, we've been diligent to be praying Mm-hmm. Uh, over the work that we have put into uh, these gardens, now, I want to. I want you to describe a little bit about what we're looking out uh, out here, mm-hmm. uh, and then we'll move on to uh, the big, big mm-hmm. garden. So we have how many beds do we have out there? Six, I, five or six. Um, we have we have an entire bed, front bed of herbs, uh-huh. and they're all cooking herbs and. Um, we have basil, we have thyme, we have rosemary, we have sage, we have peppermint, we have... I actually moved the oregano this year. Um, when I first planted oregano, I really didn't study about oregano, and oregano is a very bossy plant, and uh-huh. it just invades and grows. And it was really cute, because I would have little bunny rabbits that would birth their little babies, uh-huh. and it would just proliferate the oregano. But I had to lift that out and put it in a pot. So. Um, we actually have pots with radishes out there. We have oregano. We have utilized cow panels. And now before you get to the cow panels, while you're still on the uh, herbs, uh-huh. uh, every year you have not only planted but harvested a good bunch of basil mm-hmm. and have done a bulk cooking with it mm-hmm. and created this big uh, amount of uh, pesto mm-hmm. and then frozen it yeah. and and that's been a delicious and yeah. wonderful thing to, to crack open one of those and heat it up a, a little bit and have it with pasta yeah, and it's so good it is it's so good well um, the beautiful thing about our garden is we didn't make it just to look at it we no. made it to actually live off of it and eat and the smaller home garden is really not something that we're going to feed our family for a year um, but this year we have a lot of peppers, jalapenos. We have some very fun squash that are growing up the cow panels that are in between beds. They're kind of arched. And we yeah, have Armenian well, people, cucumbers, and those are delicious. That's the first year we've ever grown those. We have put we have put a cow panel uh, and bent it yeah, so arch. that it becomes mm-hmm. an archway, mm-hmm. and that allows the plants to grow up. Mm-hmm. It's a vertical garden. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you have aeration under that, uh-huh. and everything grows up, and it doesn't take as much space on the bottom so that you can still fill in the bottom. You can put your beans and your peppers, and um, it's it's just an amazing this year. We've got yeah. butternut squash out there and acorn squash. And Beautiful acorn we've squash. We've had lots of zucchini and... Um, and all of them are heirloom. Uh-huh. And okay, you know, now, that now makes talk me, about that. Why do you well, why do you I, plant I heirloom? I prefer that because they're not genetically modified. Yep. We don't like bioengineered um, seeds. And, and um, uh, well, something we try else. Try to stick with heirloom. And um, go ahead. I was just going to say some another benefit of the <coughs> heirloom is, and not that we've gotten there. We got to go one step at a time. But with heirloom vegetables, um, you can save dry and use the seeds yeah we haven't gotten to that conversation yet no. but yeah that's why we use the heirloom yeah yeah and there are a lot of people who do seed saving um i've done some of that with bigger things it, it is really kind of tedious yeah okay right fair enough. It's, uh-huh. it's, it's a lot easier just to get online order your seeds for the year and store them yeah. because they can last for 20 years and if you put them in the freezer they can last longer than that wow so Wait. um although i think that's like a very virtuous thing I, we have a lot of seeds. Yeah, we away, do. So. Absolutely. So uh, let's go ahead and take uh, a break, and we'll come back for next week and talk a little bit further about this. Uh, I know there's more to say. We haven't even gotten to the big farm yet. Oh, my goodness, um, there's more. <laughs> yes, there is. More to pick, more to eat, more to weed. <laughs> oh, yeah, the watermelons are coming up. So see? Absolutely. You could well, go back to your childhood What a good remi- reminder that I love you. Love you. Patience, we're told, is a virtue, and it is, and an elusive one at that. If patience were easy, everyone would have it. One of the places where uh, we grow most impatient most swiftly is in uh, the manifestation, or rather the execution of justice. You've heard it said that the 
the wheels of justice grind slowly, and it's absolutely true. And we've noted many times before that um, one of the frustrations commented upon in the Psalms so often is uh, that frustration over the fact that judgment seems to not come swiftly uh, to those the psalmist deems particularly wicked. Now, in the political realm, I, I think we're experiencing something of the same thing. Whatever side of the aisle you may be on, we, uh, we are in the midst of a time when the standard bearer for one party uh, is looking pretty doggone guilty uh, for influence peddling when he was vice president. And there tends to be uh, new evidence coming forth more and more frequently. And if you're on the other side of the aisle, and I'm sure there are very few of you who are who are listening to this, but nevertheless, the, there are those on that side of the aisle who uh, are persuaded that uh, the former president is guilty of uh, sedition or uh, other crimes against uh, the Constitution uh, with respect to January 6th. And they're wondering, you know, when is that hammer going to come down fully and finally? Well, in both instances, we're, we're witnessing the slowness of uh, the execution of justice. And one might argue in both instances, we're uh, witnessing the intentional stonewalling of the execution of justice. That is, there's a legal strategy that says slow everything down, and there's also uh, legal shenanigans by which that can be uh, brought to pass. In fact, uh, as it's often said, the cover-up is usually worse than the scandal itself, and that may be uh, what finally brings down uh, the Biden family and the Department of Justice and the, the again, increasing evidence that uh, both uh, the FBI and the Department of Justice have been profoundly uh, politicized and told, don't go investigate this, do go investigate that. Well, the Bible takes a different perspective. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 37, uh, which begins this way. Do not fret thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass. Hmm. They shall soon be cut down. Which obviously begs the question, how soon is soon? Which then in turn raises the question, where are our eyes and our hope set? As I grow older and closer to the end of my life, I become increasingly aware of the reality of my comparative lack of faith about the ongoing future of my life. That is, the older I get, the more ashamed I am of the fact that I act like this life is the only life there is. What if God said to you, the rest of your life, you are going to be considered guilty by everyone around you. You will suffer the consequences of what you've been falsely accused of. But when you die, you will be exonerated. When Jesus comes back, the guilt of those who determine that you are guilty will be publicly displayed for everyone to see. Would you be okay with that? Why do we insist on having it now? I would suggest that we insist on having it now because we don't believe having it then really counts. The other side of the veil seems to us to sort of be almost... A, a, a mythical country, a, a uh, Valhalla that's not actually real. When the truth is, it's more real than the world we're living in. And when we are falsely accused, or when the guilty are excused in their guilt, it's only temporary. The wheels of justice may grind slowly, but ultimately, the wheels of justice are performed 
perfectly. They always reach the right destination. Now, it may be that some of the things you want to see people convicted of before the tribunal of God have already been convicted by the tribunal of God, and the sentence has already been uh, not only declared, but served by the Lord Jesus. That is, sinners uh, sin against each other. If you're not okay with that, well, you might face judgment on your own. We ought to be okay because the God of heaven and earth always does right. He will do right politically. I'm not saying be indifferent, be impassive. I'm not embracing fatalism here. I'm not saying you shouldn't be active, but you should always do it from a posture of peace and confidence. Do not fret. It only does harm. It's all too easy for people who have an interest in theology to become way too pedantic. You know, pedantic is not an easy word. It simply means, though, uh, prone to an excessive uh, fussiness about precision, etc. So a pedantic theologian is, uh, you know, one who grumbles about a distinction that doesn't really make much of a difference. Well, one of the ways that shows up is when we're talking about the five points of Calvinism, which make up the acrostic tulip, uh, T for total depravity, U for limited, uh, excuse me, unconditional election, L for limited atonement, I for irresistible grace, and P for perseverance of the saints. And uh, the the sort of grumbling begins with the uh, notion that while TULIP may have uh, an advantage in terms of making it easier to remember or uh, to communicate, it's not necessarily designed to uh, be you know, the most accurate. And so people might want to go to radical depravity or uh, sovereign uh, election or something like that. Well, when they get to the P, Ironically, the, the second choice or the, or the one first choice to replace perseverance of the saints is very close. It is preservation of the saints. What's the difference between perseverance and preservation? Well, if you understand the sovereignty of God in all things, not much at all. But the idea is that preservation uh, vers- well, perseverance, rather, sort of communicates with it this notion that it is the one persevering who is responsible. The doctrine teaches that all those who come to true saving faith in the finished work of Christ and are redeemed will stay that way, that you can't lose your salvation. Another uh, not healthy way of expressing it is once saved, always saved. But perseverance of the saints carries with it, uh, again, to some, that idea that it's the person. Whereas preservation of the saints emphasizes that it is God himself who preserves us in the faith. I'm not sure who said it, but some someone once said something along the lines of, If my perseverance depended upon me holding on to Christ, I would have no hope. But happily, it depends upon him holding on to me. Now, I mention all of this because uh, today our month of Sunday's lesson takes us to a, uh, a profoundly important and significant and symbolic, I believe, event in the life and work of Noah. Uh, the last time we uh, looked at our did our month of Sunday segment, we talked about uh, God's wrath coming upon the world. And when we come uh, now to Genesis chapter seven, we have uh, the repetition of that kind of language. God keeps saying to Noah, "I'm going to do this." He keeps saying to Noah, "Gather these." people, you know, your, your wife and your sons and their wives, gather these animals, gather the food. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Uh, we get to the place where it's only a week away. And he says, you know, a week from now, I'm going to start the rain and I'm going to open the floodgates from beneath and everything's going to be wet. <laughs> well, at one, when that week is up, God gives another bit of instruction, specific instruction saying to Noah, I want you to go ahead and get in, get in the boat. And so Noah and his family and all the animals get in the boat. 
And then there is this moment, this beautiful uh, moment where the word of God says in verse 16, uh, well, yeah, so those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. Isn't it interesting that uh, Moses goes to the trouble to tell us who closed the door? Do you think, and I've, I've said this before, if you want a hint of when the Bible's trying to tell you something that's maybe not so obvious, it tells you something that you really don't need to know, right? If this text didn't say, and the Lord shut him in, would any of you think to yourselves as you're reading this text, oh no, the water's going to come in. Oh no, they're going to die. Oh no, the door's still open. No, you wouldn't think that. But he tells us anyway, the Lord shut him in. He tells us who did this. The ark, friends, represents rescue, salvation, redemption, the carrying of God of his people to a new and better land, a separating of his people from his just judgment. And God not only commanded Moses to make the ark, God not only told Moses to get in the ark, but God shut the door. God secured Noah and his family inside the ark, which was the place of security. Some have said, and I think there's merit to this as well, that the ark is a, a beautiful symbol of the church. I'd rather say it's a beautiful symbol of being in Christ. He is our ark. He is our rescue. And it is his father who puts us in him. What a beautiful reality. What a cause for celebration and joy and peace. Because, you know, when God puts you in a safe place and he shuts the door, you're not going to get out of that safe place. He loves us and he always will because he'll always keep us in Christ. The segment that we call that 70s kid uh, tends to be fairly heavy on what was on television in the 70s and what toys were in the 70s because I was a kid in the 70s and I like nothing more than to play with toys uh, and to... Uh, watch television. So that makes sense. I wanted to talk today. I've already mentioned, I think, uh, probably my uh, most well-used Christmas present I ever got, which was one of those wind-up uh, Evil Knievel uh, motorcycles uh, that just, boy, spent hours and hours on that. But uh, today I want to just remember some of the really weird toys from the 70s. Toys that that uh, at least, unless you go looking for it with the help of Google, you're probably not going to find uh, again. Let's start with, I don't even know what to call it, but I remember uh, getting this sort of uh, water-propelled pressure rocket thing where uh, it was a little plastic rocket, maybe six inches uh, tall, and you put it in a stand like like a like the space or like the uh, Saturn rockets were in and you would pump uh, pressure into this water. And then at some point it would s just take off and go into the sky, just hundreds and hundreds of feet, uh, which was really cool. But what was even more cool was that it would then deploy somehow. I don't remember how a, uh, at least it was supposed to a parachute and come back down and you can do it all over again. I remember that because I think I had one successful turn at it. I remember being probably that second time it landed on somebody's roof and that was the end of that. Uh, but I remember just that joy of watching that happen. I remember also trying to recreate it with another uh, less than exciting toy uh, from the 70s. You, you, some of you will remember you would get this little army man, typical army man size, maybe two inches tall, uh, you know, and colored in green. But attached to his back was a couple of strings connected again to a uh, parachute. 
And you could either just throw this thing in the air and wait for the parachute to come out and they would uh, land, or sometimes there would be a little uh, hook on this and you could sort of slingshot it with a rubber band up high into the sky. I, I, there was just a big uh, fascination with sending things into the sky and having them parachute down. Well, uh, that's a couple of them. Maybe, though, the... Uh, no, let me mention one more, too, that... Uh, two more that you may remember. One, uh, I don't even know what you did with these things, uh, but they were like tops. They they were the size of a baseball, and uh, but sticking out of the bottom of it would be a, a polyurethane uh, sort of tip that was connected to some sort of motor, and you, you would rub that tip across on the ground to get it wound up, and then it would spin, and you could get one that looked like a 7-Up can, and I... <laughs> It doesn't, I guess maybe the point was to see how long you could make it go. I don't know. It wasn't much fun uh, for me, but I still wanted one. <laughs> That's how kids are. But the weirdest thing, and, the, and, and after I tried this next thing once, I was like, I never need to do this again. I have no interest in this. Do you remember that you could get uh, a little tube that was filled with a kind of greasy tacky substance like pitch or like tar that was mostly black but had multiple colors in it and you would you would squeeze a little bit of that out and then you would uh you know rub it between your two palms and uh, make a ball into it and then you would stick it on the end of the accompanying straw and then you would slowly blow into that straw and you would smell the most noxious odor. I don't know what, like, like tar, like when you, when they're tarring a road and, and it just smells so bad, you'd smell that's right there by your face and, and you're blowing out, you're blowing out and it's expanding. And, uh, <laughs> for me anyway, too often, uh, I'm blowing out and I'm blowing out and the stench gets to me so badly. And all of a sudden I, I suck in and destroy the thing. But if you succeed, you make a bubble that gets so, so big and you have to decide how big you want to risk it. And then you gently pull it off the uh, uh, straw and sort of touch together the opening so that it closes on itself. And now you have this smelly, nasty, uh, tarry, pitch-like balloon that wasn't good for anything. I mean, it's, it's one of those toys where you do this and you're like, well, now what? What, what's the point? This is not, this is no fun at all. Kind of reminds me of those uh, the submarines too. Another another toy from that era where you get a little plastic submarine, maybe I don't know three or four inches uh, uh, long, and you would you could split it in half, and there would be a hole in there, and you would put baking soda in the hole, close it back up, and then you put it in your bathtub, and it would rise and fall. You know they don't have these things anymore. Maybe maybe this just gets pushed out by screen time uh in in this day and age but as odd as these things were and uh i don't know maybe useless as these things were at least they weren't you weren't just watching somebody do something uh you were actually doing it so that's my memory of some of the toys uh from my childhood there are more i could list i i, I loved the the tabletop uh hockey game with the uh little pins that you pushed around. That was uh, one of my favorites as well. Uh, my dad also loved to play that, and it was very competitive. Well, boy, it's been a long time. And uh, every every day I get a day older, but I don't uh, forget the 70s because I am that 70s kid. <laughs> We live in strange times. It used to be said that the only two things we could be certain of were death and taxes. Taxes you can still be pretty sure of, but death, death has recently become rather more cloudy. With the advent of assorted technological wonders in the field of medicine, we can watch as a patient's heart continues to beat, but whose brain waves show no activity. With the advent of widespread organ transplants, we are all the more eager to say of the donee that he or she is dead in one sense, 
while keeping him or her alive in another for as long as we can. Add to this the strange reports we read from those who say they've died but who have returned. They claim to have been dead enough to have been embraced by the light. But nevertheless, they walk among us. Death has become, for us, more like dusk than that dark night. There are, however, limits to this lack of clarity. While dusk seeks to evade the question, is it night or is it day, we do know that midnight is night and noon is day. And while the comatose, brainwaveless, but still breathing patient may confuse us, we know that the nurses who tend to the patient are alive, and the bodies that have been in cold storage for days down in the morgue are dead. That the bridge across the chasm is shrouded in fog doesn't change the reality that there are two distinct mountains. It's important for us to understand this truth, to not be drawn into the beard fallacy where one argues that the removal of one, then another, then another whisker will provide no definitive moment from beard to non-beard. It's important because central to our faith is this conviction. Jesus died. We are not affirming that the brainwave monitor went blank for a while. We're not arguing that the Roman medical authorities broke their own rules and continued administering CPR for over half an hour. Jesus was all the way dead. Midnight dead. God ordained, before anyone had ever heard of crucifixion, that the Messiah should hang from a tree. We now know what crucifixion does to a person, the slow suffocation that makes the nails seem like kids' play. God ordained that Jesus would be pierced in his side. We see there the water and the blood flowing out, a sign of a burst heart, both literally and figuratively. And then, three days in the ground. That is the one that has always puzzled me. God didn't need three days to put Jesus back together again, any more than he needed six days to make the universe and all that is in it. It doesn't take three days for God to muster the strength for such a miracle. But it might take three days to prove that the resurrection was a miracle, to make us see that this death was not just dusk, but midnight dark. Paul tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If there's no resurrection, our faith is vanity. And if there is no death, there can be no resurrection. The death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ are inescapably bound together. You cannot have one without the other. And you have no Christianity without both. Our faith is a historical faith, grounded not in our own efforts, not in the mystical powers of an objectless faith, but in historical events. We have peace with God because of what we believe about events that happen on a particular hill and in a particular tomb outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. We affirm, first, contra the ancient Docetists and their modern heirs, that Jesus was born a man. To die, one must first be alive. Jesus was no ghost, no phantom who only appeared, appeared as a man. Second, we affirm that this Jesus lived not only in complete obedience to the law of God, but that he did so in history and in full view of his enemies who could lay no charge against him. Next, we affirm that this Jesus wrought miracles in particular places and for historical people. The water was truly water and it became truly wine. Jesus even brought life from death, most dramatically in the life of Lazarus, dead four days, decomposing, and not merely flatlined for a moment. And then he, who had the power of his life in him, died, laying down his life for the sheep. He did not swoon, he did not fall into a coma, he died, and there was only darkness." 
He did not, however, stay dead. Three days later, this same Jesus, to be sure with his body now glorified, one that was in one sense continuous with his old body, but in another, very different, threw off the bonds of death and emerged as the first fruit of the new creation. It was not that hope was raised, as too many unbelieving liberal wolves will proclaim on Easter Sunday. It was not some sort of spirit body, as Gnostics, both ancient and modern, have claimed. As Thomas discovered, it was an altogether human body, once dead, but now alive. These historical truths also have theological meaning. The life he lived, he lived vicariously for his elect. He obeyed so that we might have his righteousness. And he died for our sins, taking upon himself the wrath of the Father for us. He was raised in vindication to prove his own innocence and to begin the new creation, to ascend on high, to put everything under his feet. When that work is complete... This same Jesus, with this same glorified body, will return to consummate his kingdom. The theological meaning not only does not undo the historical reality, but requires the historical reality to even have meaning. This is the light of resurrection morning, a light so brilliant as to be unmistakable. A Jesus who did not die, a Jesus who was not raised, such is a Jesus that cannot save. Such is a Jesus that is foreign to the inerrant word of God. To negotiate with these truths is to negotiate with our own souls, with our own eternity. And such is neither right nor safe. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Here we stand. We can do no other. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit R.C. Sproul Jr. And join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.